Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the nomikeyshow.com to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers. Hello, and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst. We are two weeks from Christmas, or if you're Fox News, we are at the height of the war on Christmas. And... Americans are going hungry. 26 million adult Americans say that they aren't getting enough to eat, according to the Census Bureau. The Agricultural Department estimates that 54 million Americans are struggling with hunger right now. And the Washington Post ran a chilling story today about the rise of shoplifting at grocery stores. You know one of the items people are stealing? baby formula. This is America, friends, the richest, most powerful country in the world. All that American imperialism and exceptionalism, at what cost? For whom? Millions of people are hungry, and some of them are so desperate that they are stealing baby formula. And what are our congressional leaders doing about this humanitarian crisis on their land, on their watch? They are quibbling over a relief package that is not even close to enough, even if they passed it. Have you hurt? Have you no heart? Have you no shame? Frankly, even if you have no heart and no shame, you need to wake up and see how dangerous this all is. The twin pillars of our country, your market capitalism, liberal democratic country are being blown over in this COVID storm. The Trump-led campaign to destroy democratic elections And the COVID recessions, erosions of any reason to believe in the fairness of market capitalism, they are very quickly going to leave you on both sides of the aisle with no place to stand. Part of me truly wants that to happen. You know, the Leninist in me, Uh, we need to have a revolution, as Bernie says, and Lenin. I'd like it to still be peaceful and small d democratic. But we are running out of pressure points in government. Nobody in leadership seems to care or be influenced by their constituencies. If our political leadership drives Americans into hunger and destroys the legitimacy of elections, what do you think is going to happen next? Senator McConnell, Speaker Pelosi, I am talking to you. Even if you don't care at all about these women stealing formula to feed their babies, give a care to the state of the country. We can't leave so many people suffering through Christmas in the winter ahead. There is a woman from Maryland named Jean in that Washington Post story. Her son's daycare center suddenly closed in April, which forced her to give up her $15 an hour job as a receptionist. But because she quit, she didn't qualify for unemployment. 
She says she was denied food stamps at least three times and gave up on local food banks because of the lines that we have seen in videos. So this is this this with nowhere else to turn. She started hiding food in her son's stroller as she wheeled him through Walmart. Think about the desperation. She said, quote, I just didn't know what else to do. It wasn't malicious. We were hungry. It's not something I'm proud of, but it is what I had to do. It is what I had to do, Jean says. How about you, Speaker Pelosi and Senator McConnell? Are you proud of what's happening? What do you have to do? I'll tell you. I mean, anybody will tell you. Pass a relief bill now. Include a $1,200 stimulus check for Gene. Renew the $600 unemployment supplement for the millions of people still out of work. And that is only going to grow. While you are at it, make sure all the government food prog- programs are funded and in good shape. Make sure local child care programs are funded too and can operate so Gene can go back to work. Make sure cities have the funding to provide their end of the relief. Oh, and Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and all the other blessings these seasons. Not to mention, not to bring up uh, climate change, but this is no holiday for lumps of coal in our stockings, okay? It's the holiday when we need to say to everyone, we are going to make it through to the spring. And no one, no one can help more than Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi. So have a conscience, have humanity, And if that's too much for you, have a bit of political common sense. You can't send 50 million Americans to bed hungry on Christmas Eve and expect the new year to be bright or stable. You think you'll be exempt from the political fury that will be unleashed when come January 1st, millions of Americans are evicted? (laughs) We have a great show today. Speaking of conscience, Marianne Williamson will be here talking about the soul of America and later... We have the one and only Representative Chris Rabb. He'll be here to talk about his reparations bill that he has currently sitting in the Pennsylvania legislature. So stick around, make sure to smash that like button, subscribe, get into that chat, start to debate, because up next we have the one and only Marianne Williamson. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. I am so excited to have one of our greatest leaders right now in this country, in this movement. Uh, she's most recently a presidential candidate running on the Democratic Party line. She's the author of 14 exceptional books, an activist, host of the new Marianne Williamson podcast, the one and only Marianne Williamson. So excited to have you on the show. And I think you're on mute just as a heads up. Sorry Very. about that. And you, for, thank you for your generous introduction, but you forgot to mention old friends. <laughs> I was going to get to that. <laughs> Wait, let's just start off with that. Okay. Marianne uh, has not only been a friend and a mentor, but I, 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 I blame you for urging me to run for office. <laughs> I remember that. I do remember. And Francis Fisher introduced us. Yes, Francis Fisher, yeah. the one and only. Yeah. So it's great to see you again. It's been too long. Wonderful seeing you too. So I, I, I want to start off, uh, I don't want to bury the lead. Tell us about your new podcast. Oh, thank you. You know, uh, one of my favorite lines from Martin Luther King, he said, our lives begin to end on the day we stop talking about things that matter. And our society has been before the pandemic, previous to the pandemic, we were so preoccupied, most of us, most of the time, because of the assault, the ubiquitous assault of the ultimately meaningless uh, that dominates our popular culture. We spent so much time talking about, reading about, and thinking about things that don't ultimately matter. I think that that's begun to change. And I think that there is a hunger. And also we have time and bandwidth that in many cases we didn't have before. The truth is we have some great thinkers, great writers, great people who are out there in American culture and world culture. And so it's exciting to have a chance to uh, invite some of the people 
I read, I'm excited by, whether it's Stephanie Kelton or, um, uh, or, or Matt Taibbi, whether, you know, whether it's a political voice or whether it's a, a spiritual voice, I'm doing both. Uh, Carolyn Mace, um, uh, wonderful people. Just if, 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 if I'm interested in them, I think that it's more of, a, more of a chance that the audience will be interested in. It's really exciting. I'm enjoying doing it as I assume you enjoy doing this yourself. It's also very important at this moment uh, yeah. with the assault on corporate media, which we know too well, to have more voices. Uh, we were talking <laughs> about this sure. at the beginning of the show. <laughs> yeah. If we want to push back against the propaganda, uh, the corporate yeah. propaganda and, and the military industrial complex propaganda, we need to really populate as many spaces as possible. And I, I think what you're talking about there is extremely significant because the mainstream corporate media, as you know, um, and as you said, uh, that does dominate and pre-prescribe what we are to consider the political issues that matter routinely peripheralizes not only progressive voices but more important cultural voices philosophical mm -hmm. voices spiritual voices religious voices artistic voices humanitarian voices that absolutely should be part of of the dialogue this whole idea that politics is just a lane over here and it's a group of people that are the ones who are 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 somehow entitled to not only say what they think, but to, to literally prescribe what the conversation will even be, much less who should be in that conversation, has taken us to where we are. And the idea that we're looking to the people whose mindset took us to where we are to lead us out of the ditch that they drove us into is seen, I think, by a lot of, a lot of increasing number of people to be absurd. You ran a transformational presidential campaign. You undoubtedly uh, shifted the conversation, scared a lot of people. But I, I have this memory. Uh, I can't remember which debate it was. I, I Possibly the first debate. After the debate, you sat down with Anderson Cooper. And Anderson Cooper's mother had just recently passed away. And I was so moved by the conversation you had with him um, in which he seemed to recognize your value and your presence and what you meant, not just for the democratic primary, but for society and, and, and the, the effect you've had on so many people uh, in his orbit himself. And I thought it was a really moving conversation. And then to suddenly see mm -hmm. the corporate media swoop in and just, it, it was like, it was like he hadn't caught up with the talking points yet that he was yeah. forced to share. Um, they were clearly scared of you. I mean, the way that yeah. they treated you compared to other candidates who polled less, never, you know, never broke through the pack, never won a state. Um, it was very clear what their agenda was. I mean, how did that feel for you? Well, it's, it's interesting that you name uh, Anderson Cooper because you're right. I had talked to him twice on the air. There had been meaningful conversations. I had known his mother, although he had not known that. Um, and then clearly someone said, you're being way too nice to her. I mean, it was so it was so clearly clear that someone said, get that woman off the stage. And you're right. And the the talking points, which we all know how that works, uh, they were they were specific. They were everywhere. I'm dangerous, Nomiki. I'm crazy. You'd think it was the Middle Ages or something. She's dangerous. She's crazy. She's anti-vax. She's anti-science. <laughs> she's anti-medicine. She's, anti she's a grifter. Um, and uh, you're right. And, and with him, when he really was an ambush because he was bringing up the, t the topic of uh, involving big pharma. I should have come right back at him. Uh, it's so funny because uh, to look back at that and think uh, I should have just been tougher and given it right back. But uh, I was shocked and obviously not, not ready for that moment. Well, they also hadn't really uh, in recent history treated a candidate the way that they treated you. I think they tried with Bernie. I'm, I'm not saying that they, that he, he did not receive, he has not received pushback, but I think they saw, they saw this movement growing and coming. And not only was there Bernie on stage, there was you and, and Andrew Yang and so, to some extent, although now he's a CNN contributor. So I think he was given a different uh, uh, set of questions, but I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. I mean, aside from the media experience, what was the biggest lesson, uh, political lesson you learned out of your, your time running for president? Well, it's like there are two parallel universes. I found talking to voters exhilarating. The American people are not stupid. Uh, I think we're dignified, decent people. And I had had over 30 years of experience talking uh, to people, you know, just audiences. So my faith in that sense in democracy was fortified. My concern, deep concern about how the political media industrial complex suppresses and obstructs democracy was also fortified because I've seen how the whole thing works. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's one experience when you're talking to people and it's another thing to see this reality TV show of how campaigns operate, um, the operatives, the, the way the media is so cozy, most of the mainstream media is so cozy with people they shouldn't be so cozy with. You, you, there shouldn't be reporters yeah. getting their getting their talking points from the Tom Perez's of the world, but on some level, that's clearly how it works. Yeah. Oh, I I, I know that firsthand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um. You know, we're going into this new presidency. Joe Biden, of course, won. You you as I did said it was the smarter decision to vote for Joe Biden. Um. But the pressure does not stop there. Clearly. Uh, he won. We don't throw our hands up in the air. But he is making it, and and the Democratic establishment are making it very difficult for progressives to feel like they can pressure um, the establishment. Establishment just seems right now to be extremely, uh, they're just, just ignoring, not the left, but working people. I mean, it's very concerning to see the appointments in the transition committee, um, who, who they're prioritizing, big business, pharma, big ag, uh, Monsanto, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously a list of, of major corporations, Uber, Lyft, et cetera. And yet labor is missing from the conversation. And of course, anybody um, who has been part of the rising left, you know, you, what I loved about your campaign is that you just saw political power from a completely different perspective. And I think it blew people's minds in many good ways to see what, what could be brought to the table, like reparations, like a department of peace. And then you see the Biden administration have this rotating cast of characters that have been in the in the administrations in the past, or have been have worked for Raytheon, have worked for um, the military industrial complex, the the consulting firms, and just to see how different his message is to what I think Americans and the world needs right now, given this crisis. So, how do you see us? able to mobilize and and push for change when you have an administration, from my opinion, that is just completely, has blinders up. Uh, a woman has taught her whole life that if anybody comes at you to mug you or to attack you, just start screaming and don't shut up. I did, as you said, and as you did, uh, say, I, I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. I think it's important that we vote for Joe Biden because the most important uh, priority had to be at that moment, removing the neo-fascists from the White House. I thought he would be a moment of pause, uh, giving us an opportunity to regroup. And that's exactly what we need to do now. Um, I want to give credit where credit's due. I didn't think Janet Yellen was a terrible um, uh, choice. I'm okay with Blinken as long as uh, uh, Rashida uh, Tlaib is also there to make sure he remembers some things and he needs to remember. I'm not, a, I'm not uh, upset with Mayorkas, but then some of these others that are coming in, and you mentioned Raytheon. I think we need to yell and keep yelling when it comes to the appointment of, of Austin, Lloyd Austin, as at the Pentagon. First of all, what does it mean for Congress to pass bills and then just use a waiver to ignore any that they don't like. So that's first of all. Second of all, he was on the board. He has been on the board of Raytheon. We're already talking about a $760 billion defense budget compared to a $40 billion State Department budget. Anything that has to do with humanitarian assistance, anything that has to do with uh, USAID, anything that has to do with peace building is given just these little crumbs. Diplomacy in general is given crumbs compared to the militarization of our foreign policy. I read an article a couple of years ago uh, where one of those, uh, the people within the military uh, within the foreign uh, policy establishment said, airstrikes are in, diplomacy is out. Oh my so God. <laughs> it was interesting because I heard Austin, I know it's, it's so hideous. So I heard Austin on television yesterday, clearly trying to do damage control, clearly showing up now in his business suit rather than his general's uniform saying, I totally respect the wisdom, the wisdom of the founders in wanting um, civilian leadership. My doubt, I, I don't doubt his sincerity as a human being, but he wouldn't know about the wisdom of civilian leadership because that's not where he's been. He knows about the wisdom of military leadership. He knows about the, his filter is Raytheon. His filter is the military. All of those have a place. They should not be the boss. So when you ask, what do we do? We need to talk about it and not shut up about it. And that's what certainly I'm trying to do. Uh, my social media, any platform that I have, this man should not head the Pentagon. And there are too many people. If we have, the last one was a general, 
they they passed a waiver for for Mattis. Then they're going to pass a waiver for this one. We're going to get to the point where we have so normalized military military leadership of our foreign policy establishment, which is already horrifying. When you uh, if you ever read Ronan Farrow's book, War on Peace. I mean, it's become a joke. The State Department has been so peripheralized, or in the case of the Trump uh, Trump administration, turned over uh, more to economic issues than to security issues, such as the three hundred and sixty billion dollar arms sale to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And you know, when they asked him about the obvious immorality of that in terms of uh, people starving in Yemen, he said, "Sometimes you can have strategic partnerships with people who do not share your values." So human values are just peripheralized, while the militarization, the um, use of brute force, all of these things are seen more and more as central to American foreign policy. This is disastrous. And when you ask, what do we need to do about it? Start yelling and yeah. don't shut up. Yeah. And, you know, and it's all for what? To protect oil interest, geopolitical, you know, yeah. pseudo Cold War uh, games that are happening. It's 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 ridiculous. Um so I, I want to talk about a couple of things. Uh, we, first, we have some, a lot of people in the chat are asking, and, and this is their question. Uh, they're, they're campaigning, they're rallying around you, uh, potentially running against one of the biggest defenders of the military industrial complex in the Senate, Senator Dianne Feinstein. Have you thought about this at all? Is this on the table? She's got four more years, first of all, doesn't she? She has four more years. Um, you know, it's funny because at this point in my life, I'm living in D.C. now. I was in New York for two years before the, camp the, um, uh, b before the campaign. It's sort of like, where do I come from? It's almost like there's no state, including California, where I wouldn't be seen as a bit of a carpetbagger. Um, and also, I think it's pretty interesting, Nikki, I think that the state parties, when you look in California would be an example, so would New York, there are people who have been lining up for years uh, to running to run for something like Diane C. The pushback, the blowback, the hostility, the viciousness would be every bit as as hard uh, for a Senate race as for a president. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we've seen this happen. I mean, I even saw it at my local level uh, yeah. when I ran the, yeah. the viciousness, the no scares, the attacks. Mm -hmm. No easy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, I think folks also need to be prepared for that. While we urge everybody to run, also be prepared for what could come if you're seen as a threat, if you're representing the left, and especially if you're representing the left against somebody who wants to appear to be left. <laughs> and especially in a state like California, where yes. so many people have been standing in line for so long. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, I want to quickly talk about reparations because our next segment, we are going to have Representative Chris Rabb, who is a, a legislator in Pennsylvania who has a reparations bill uh, that he's prevent, presented before the legislature. But you really uh, brought to light and I think pressured other lawmakers uh, to come out in support of reparations, as well as your colleagues on stage. And it was, I think that should be in the history books. I mean, the moment that you brought the, ex you explained what reparations would be, the history of reparations to a Americans who may not be familiar with it. Um, you became a great conduit for, for the idea of a reparations bill to be in the mainstream. And I want to play a quick clip. Dorsey, can we put the clip up from the debate, um, uh, the Democratic debate where Marianne brought this up? Thank you, Congressman Rourke. Speaking of reparations, Ms. Williams, Ms. Williamson, many of your opponents support a commission to study the issue of reparations for slavery, but you are calling for up to $500 billion in financial assistance. What makes you qualified to determine how much is owed in reparations? Well, first of all, it's not $500 billion in financial assistance. It's $500 billion, 200 to $500 billion payment of a debt that is owed. That is what reparations is. We need some deep truth telling when it comes. We don't need another commission to look at evidence. I appreciate what uh, Congressman O'Rourke has said. It is time for us to simply realize that this country will not heal. All that a country is is a collection of people. People heal when there's some deep truth telling. 
We need to recognize that when it comes to the economic gap between blacks and whites in America, it does come from a great injustice that has never been dealt with. That great injustice has had to do with the fact that there was 250 years of slavery followed by another 100, 100 years of domestic terrorism. What makes me qualified to say 200 to 500 billion dollars? I'll tell you what makes me qualified. If you did the math of the 40 acres and a mule, given that there was four to five million slaves at the end of, of, of the Civil War, there were four to five, and they were all promised 40 acres and a mule for every family of four. If you did the math today, it would be trillions of dollars. And I believe that anything less than 100 billion dollars is is an insult, and I believe that 200 to 500 billion is, is politically feasible today because so many Americans realize there is an injustice that continues to form a toxicity underneath the surface, an emotional turbulence Ms. that Williamson, only reparations Thank will you very much. Senator Sanders. I have the chills watching that again, and you're right here. <laughs> I, the audience clearly responded. Uh, yeah, that's Detroit. <laughs> it's, it was Detroit, right? They know exactly. what goes down. They know the truth about rights in Detroit. Exactly. So, I mean, what we're really, conf- I'm so happy you mentioned we don't need another commission because I think we that know is, what happened. yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that is a game for, for those of you watching right now, that is a game that, uh, that, that, that is played in union halls. It's played in organizations. It's played in Congress. It's played in democratic party. If you want to delay something, set up, up a commission. And then you put and- it on the shelf. Then you put it on the shelf. Exactly. And, and then you put it on the yeah. shelf, you drag it out, people don't pay attention, and then you water it down. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why when people so, talk about I think we're, we're having a little bit of a delay here. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, and that, that I agree with you entirely. And when John Conyers came up with HR 40 for his time, that was really radical to, to go there, to have a commission to start talking about it. But now we need to start putting some money on the table. And I felt that, uh, that it's time. You know, Germany has paid $89 billion to Jewish organizations in reparation since World War II. It doesn't mean the Holocaust didn't happen. But it has gone far towards establishing psychological and emotional reconciliation between Germany and the Jews of Europe. That war was over in 1945. We're talking about a war that was over in 1864, 1865. And as I said in that clip, the toxicity, the burden, the injustice, the anger is like a baton that we just pass from one generation to the next. And for a nation, just like for an individual, you've got to clean up things from the past if you really want the future to be as free as it could be. This is not, um, when you look at something like Germany and, and the Jews, By the 20th century, the idea of paying reparations was not considered some fringe idea, and it should not be considered fringe idea today. Uh, It doesn't have to be this long, uh, painful, anguished conversation if someone simply presents it to people intelligently. I, in my experience on the campaign in some of the whitest states out there, Iowa, New Hampshire, my experience, Nomi Key, is not that people are racist, but so much as that or the average, I mean, obviously there are racists in America, but I don't think the average American is racist so much as the average person is deeply undereducated and underinformed about the history of race in the United States. And what I would find is when I would give people a little five minute sketch, the first slave ships came over in 1619. It, slavery lasted for almost 250 years. There were between 400 and 500, uh, 400 and 500, 5 million slaves at the end. Tecumseh Sherman uh, said to every former slave family of four, we will give you 40 acres and a mule, which would have given people an opportunity to move forward with their lives. In the vast majority of cases that, that was not given, even where it was given, it was taken back. After 12 years of of Reconstruction, you had what amounted to 100 years after the end of the Civil War until the Civil Rights Act of Segregation, which is domestic terrorism. You're talking about 350 million, uh, 50 years of violence, systemic institutionalized violence perpetrated by one group of people against another. Let's just talk about this. Let's just really put a, a number on the table. We had the Civil Rights Act in 1964 We had the Voting Rights Act uh, in 1965. And if Martin Luther King had lived, then I think the next thing we would have gotten to was the economic peace. It's simply something that has not been done yet. And I feel that it's our generation's turn. 
And you know, what's interesting is, is so you look at South America, for, for instance, <clears throat> where there were, there were political genocides. There was a war against communists or anybody who might be affiliated or related to a communist or a mm-hmm. union member. In many parts of South America, pretty much collectively, even with the divisions that exist today, there were truth and reconciliation commissions, just as there was, of course, in South South Africa. And there were economic rewards given to many families, not rewards, what they were earned because their families were just swooped up and murdered in the middle of the night and 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 left out wherever for folks to see. Um, this is something that we, as a as a as a globe, as a democratic, lowercase d democratic, uh, you know, most democratic countries, have come to terms with, and yet we can't even do it on our on our own land. Well, and and is- of course, there's an economic model that's tied to that, correct? Well, yes, but there's also racism tied to that. Remember, we paid around twenty thousand uh, dollars under Ronald Reagan. Uh, to the Civil Liberties Act, to uh, every surviving person who had been a prisoner of the Japanese internment camps. So even in the United States, we have recognized and admitted before about terrible transgressions that were committed and for which economic remuneration made sense. What what keeps a lot of this, uh, the conversation stuck here is how many people say, yes, but that happened before I was born, generations before I was born. And even there, Nomiki, I think that there's a lot of educating that people need. Because when people recognize how the economic gap uh, that existed at the end of slavery has never been closed, and why? You know, I'm old enough to get, you know, segregation wasn't over until 1960, until 64, 65. I'm old enough to know that wasn't all that long ago. And the fact that, it happened generations before doesn't mean that the, that the nation can go forward the way we wanna go forward, white America or black America, unless we're willing to pay this debt and then get on with it. That's what reparations would enable us to do. And my plan was for 500 billion, which I believe could be more now. People have convinced me it could be up to a trillion dollars. That is, and some people should be much more than that. I don't think anything more than that is feasible. But we've gotta remember, You've got a $760 billion Pentagon budget every year. And my idea was not that white America should decide how the money got spent, whether it had to do with aid to historically uh, black colleges or anything else, but that the money would be handed over actually uh, over a period of 20 years to a, a commission of black Americans who represented voices in academia and politics and leadership and civic government in all the various ways. And the choice of these people obviously would be extremely, extremely important. And that they themselves uh, would get to decide white people shouldn't be telling black people how that money gets spent. And um, I think it will be actually, to use an oft used phrase now, very healing for the country. (laughs) <laughs> you're referencing how uh, yeah. Joe Biden has co-opted your phrase. <laughs> they take the messages. Is if only they took the policy position, that'd be very happy. Do you send them your book now? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Well, that was very clear. But, you know, what's inside the book is not just what's outside. But the, the quotes made it obvious. Some of his quotes made it obvious. Yeah. He just needed the talking points. Just insert that in the book with it. Um, uh, before we wrap up, I, I, I want to touch on a couple of things. But first, just... Is, do you think that there's an entrance point um, to have this conversation with Joe Biden who, who credits Black Americans for his win? And of course, Kamala Harris, who is a Black American, who, to have this conversation about reparations? Were they open to it at all during behind the scenes, maybe? Well, uh, if you'll remember, if, if you'll remember the, the debate where I brought up, I said the Democratic Party should stand for reparations. And it was uh, the vice president-elect who said, no, I'm the person uh, on this on this stage who should talk about that. And of course, he went right to another topic immediately. If I was then who I am now, I would have said, wait, what just happened here? So when we talk about Israel, Bernie and I are the only people who get to talk, you know, I would have been far more like what I was really. Um, it's an uncomfortable conversation, I think, uh, for a lot of people. But look, I, I'm not, I, I don't doubt Joe Biden's sincerity in wanting to deal with issues of systemic racism. Uh, I know a lot of people who watch a show are guffawing that I said that, but I'm not somebody who just wants to pre-damn everything they do. Um, no, nobody's <laughs> asking my opinion, but I'm still putting my opinion out there. And uh, as, as are you and others. And I think a lot of things that many of us say are noticed 
uh, whether we get a phone call or asked to attend a meeting or not. And also I've had enough experience in my life um, to know the limits to that. I, I've, I've, I've been there. I spent a weekend at Camp David. I understand. I've, I've, I've had all that. Uh, and they, they, and it's all very lovely. And then corporate America still rules on such a level that the system works the way the system works. So I think sometimes you just put a message out there. It's in the ethers. People start talking about it. And it affects in ways that you may not ever even know directly. It affects the conversation and ultimately affects politics. And that's what's going to happen in this country with many of these issues, whether it has to do with Medicare for all, free college, cancellation of the college loan debt. We just keep going. You know, that's one of the things. Republicans, they say something you don't like. What do they do? They say it again. You don't like it. They say it again. Democrats, they say something. You say something they don't like. Everybody gets all twisted and starts re-languaging re it. That's what progressives need to not do. Progressives need to do what many of us are doing, which is more like the Republicans do. You don't like what I said. Let me say it again. Medicare for all, you didn't like that. Let me say it for, again, Medicare for all. And I do think that's happening. There are a lot of us out there. And it's like in advertising, sometimes you have to say something three times before it even really gets into anybody's head. We just need to start yelling and not shut up. What are your plans for 2021? Anything big? Uh, well, I, I have my podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm talking to some people about the development of a television show, perhaps. I'd like to do a nightly uh, sort of... Um, Wrap up. You know, Namiki, I felt for a long time that if Oprah and Jon Stewart had not gone off the air when they did, that Trump would never have became, mm. become president. Because wow. when the Oprah show was on, it's like we had a town meeting every day of a, just a conversation around human decency. Mm. And every night with Jon Stewart on, there was a hip conscious take on the news. They sort of held something together both in politics and in just human dignity and decency. And there was no town square of dignity, decency, and hip conscious politics. And uh, that's what all of us are trying to do to the best of our ability. And uh, I want to do it too. I love that. I mean, it's uh, you, of course, are, are friends with Oprah and we're regular on Oprah. I, 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 have, I have my own opinions about her her political perspective and maybe her even um, in terms of capitalism. But I do think what you're saying, I mean, we did, I watched it regularly. There was a spiritual uh, depth and a focus, which you Absolutely. were a part of. And with that, I, I, I think, you know, some of the conversations around um, the spiritual movement right now and, and some of it splicing off into Trump land is, is concerning. And I think it's also very important to have your voice out there because it kind of reminds folks what, what really this is all about. And it's- Thank you. Uh, Thank As we said at the top of the show, right you know, millions of Americans are hungry right now. And that's what it comes down to. I think there is a hunger for meaning and depth. Um, if you eat just a bunch of junk food long enough, you kind of want some broccoli. Mm -hmm. If all you do is read trashy magazines and novels after a while, you're in the mood for Jane Austen. Or Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that COVID has reminded us of our depths in a way. And... Uh, and what I have found, but this has been throughout my career, but it was also true on the campaign. You know, my father was a lawyer and he used to say, talk to the smartest person on the jury. And mm -hmm. I found on the campaign that people were totally down for it. And even, like I said, talking about the widest audiences, talking about reparations. Once I gave the thumbnail sketch and made, people could see that it makes all the sense in the world, there'd be major standing ovations among all white audiences. The, the educational, I mean, excuse me, the political establishment we have today speaks to the lowest denominator yeah. because all that they're, they're trying to do is get power. Why don't we give the American people the option of doing the right thing? Why don't we give the American people the option of making the noble decision? Why don't we give the, the American people the option of following the heart's intelligence as much as the mind's intelligence, since that is the only way the human race will have a chance of surviving for another hundred years? I think the people are ready for it. The political establishment just needs to get out of the way and let the people have the conversation that the people want to have. <laughs> Make my clicks heard for the podcast. <laughs> Marianne Williamson, it has been an honor, a pleasure. Hope to see your face in person sometime soon, even Me in this, this pandemic. I miss much it and I look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne. 
All right, up next, a uh, quick little break. We have Representative Chris Rabb from the 200th District of Pennsylvania here to talk about his reparations bill uh, in the Pennsylvania House, but that'll be right after this quick break. Make sure to smash that like button, click subscribe if you're not already there, and join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show. It's how we make the show work, especially mid COVID. It's been hard, but it's our patrons who keep us going. So join us on uh, patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show for $5 a month, as low as that. All right, we'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. I'm excited to have one of our favorite regular guests, Representative Chris Rabb from the 200th District of Pennsylvania. He represents Northwest Philly, uh, the most, the, the civically excited district, I'm going to say in the country, saved our democracy from fascism. You guys turned out. We got those votes. You made it happen. And you're a big part of that because you have been organizing there. And uh, of course, that's how you got elected. He is also the author of Invisible Capital. Uh, we often forget to say that. So go check out his book, Invisible Capital. All right. So I'm not sure if you saw the interview with Marianne Williamson. Uh, we briefly talked about her reparations proposal that she brought forward during the Democratic debates, which were quickly poo-pooed by uh, the establishment. You, Rep. Rab, have a bill that you have presented uh, in the Pennsylvania legislature. Can you talk a little bit about, before we get to the actual bill, you're, you, you are a, a, a student of history. Um, every time you come on the show, you offer so much like hidden history that I love. Uh, and that's actually kind of what your book is too, is it's, it's a little bit about that hidden history. So when we talk about reparations, um, why wasn't it ever really presented or was it presented, uh, you know, whether it was after the Civil Rights Act or much earlier? Um, why are we different than so much of the rest of the world that has experienced atrocities? Um, I, I would say that we suffer from collective amnesia but in some sense, that's giving us too much credit uh, because so many of us are estranged from our history, so we never knew it to begin with. And we know more about the fiction than we do about the reality. And the fiction is stronger than reality because the fiction was created to disguise the truth, right? Because the truth was too difficult. The truth exposed our hypocrisy. And you know, being an African-American, uh, citizen, it's, it's that dual consciousness that W.B. Du Bois talks about. Um, we are able to acknowledge the collective genius of the founding fathers in creating a fragile democracy that was not meant for Black people, right? That was not meant for women. That was not meant for so many folks except for, you know, largely the landed gentry. Um, we can acknowledge that there were kernels of, of wisdom uh, within those uh, early convenings, uh, but we also see the atrocities and we also connect uh, very clearly the financial wealth and status of this country to um, enslaved laborers, uh, men, women, and children. And, and by the way, I'm very intentional about my language. I don't say slaves. I descend from 16 great, great grandparents, all who were born um, into a country before the 13th Amendment was ratified, and they all died free. Um, they were enslaved. It was a con condition thrust upon them with the complicity of state legislatures. And that's why I've introduced my bill that would address reparations, not for slavery uh, uh, writ large by society, 
but through the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Slavery was a state law, and so we have to have state um, uh, uh, measures to address our complicity as a government, the, all three branches of government. We also have to include, uh, beyond that, we also have to look at what private enterprise has done, what religious orders have done, what universities in the philanthropic industrial complex have done. And just because I believe that African-Americans are owed reparations does not mean that other aggrieved um, communities who are systematically oppressed don't deserve reparations too. So sometimes people say, oh, well, what about the Chinese? And what about the this? And what about that? Um, and I say, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about black folk. We can have a separate conversation and I can weigh the pros and cons. But oftentimes people come to me and say, well, what about the Irish? You know, I'm Irish and we weren't, we were treated, you know, so poorly and such. And I say, absolutely, you all were not considered white. Your reparations is that now you are. Right. And now you're able, you know, you, you didn't have redlining. Uh, you didn't have, I mean, I'm Greek American. Uh, a lot of folks don't know the KKK went after uh, Greek Orthodox churches. It's why when MLK went across the bridge, he was holding hands with the Archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Church. But uh, I'll tell you right now, I've never been redlined. <laughs> I don't have to check a box uh, to, to get into a college. I mean, I am perceived as a white uh, person. And, and I think that's the key point when you're talking to ethnic communities, which somehow I found myself talking to my uh, family members and friends uh, who come from ethnic communities and they, 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 they illustrate that argument, which is propaganda, as you and I both know, that's been fed to certain communities to feel like they are just as aggrieved as, as others. Right. Um, so the reconstruction, I mean, what went in in a couple of seconds? Could right. you just explain what went wrong during Reconstruction? Well, you didn't get your 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 forty acres and a mule, and uh, right. and that wasn't enough. Well, you know, here's the thing, though. the The benefit of talking about this through the lens of a state legislature is that every state has its own culture and its own connection to slavery, including those states in the North where many people did not know that there was ever slavery. So New York, New York City um, and New York State, oh, yeah. there was slavery there and it was, um, there was gradual abolition. And so in places in the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, there was slavery. That slavery was no less brutal than it was in the Deep South. It was different, but no less brutal. And just because gradual abolition started you know, decades before um, the 13th Amendment or, or the Emancipation Proclamation, the, the focus should be on gradual because they created these gradual abolition laws to maintain control over black lives um, and black bodies for as many generations as they could. So in Pennsylvania, it was 1780 that they started gradual abolition, but it took them 75 years until the last black person was freed. And then in 1838, they amended the state constitution to uh, deny black men the right to vote. So it took them another, you know, 18, what, 70 for black men to regain the right to vote. And then there was mob violence. Um, there was vigilant, white vigilantism when black folk were able to vote. Um, after 1870. And so we see that these things are gradual. We see that they don't address systemic uh, forms of oppression and that ultimately that they're just changing the labels, but the power dynamic remains. So if you're talking about police violence, the term police brutality is not decades old or generations old, it's centuries old. And that policing as we know it well, was created to surveil vagrants and folks on the margins of society. And when you're talking about, you know, the slaveocracy and our economies, um, state to state, it revolved around black folk and our mobility. In fact, in 1821, there was a law that said, you can't bring in new black people. You can't move from one township or one city to Into another. Into Pennsylvania? Into Pennsylvania and well, within well, Pennsylvania. Why was that? I mean, I mean, so, so, so some of this, and, and I want to get to this just the yeah the North versus the South and the economic 
perspective on this because you know today anybody who showed up on, a, uh, on the streets in the last you know five or six months and seen the police uh, patrol neighborhoods, especially in big cities, you see that they're protecting uh, big corporations, they're protecting banks and and big property. business and and property and uh, and it's just so um, it's just such a metaphor for for I mean in response to George Floyd's murder and Breonna Taylor's murder. Um, to see this juxtaposition of we are here to protect black lives and they are there to protect uh, property. The police are there to protect property up against the pressure about recognizing uh, the injustices and the disgusting behaviors of, of our police. Um, just in terms of, 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 of the North versus the South, I mean, I think this is what's so fascinating about Pennsylvania. You said that nobody else, there were, there were no black people who were allowed to come into Pennsylvania after, after, and move within Pennsylvania. And move within Pennsylvania. And here's what why was that's the, important. Yeah, what, yeah, how does that... So it, it goes to vagrancy laws. If, if you're a Black person who has no value to a white person because um, you may not have the skill sets they want to employ, you can't be exploited in one way or the other, then you are a nuisance. If you have no value to, to white people economically then you have no business being there. And so you're saying, well, therefore you would become a vagrant because no one will hire you. Nobody wants you. We have enough black folk as is. So if you come into our community, that means you will not be able to get a job. You can't buy property. You can't start your own business, which means that they're gonna be part of essentially the homeless community. Before they called them homeless, we called them vagrants and vagabonds. So there's state laws that were created specifically referencing Black folk, Negroes, colored, mulattoes saying you can't come in here because you don't have any usefulness to white people. And it was a state law in 1821. This was 200 years ago. And we can see the ge genealogy of racist laws from 200 years ago to today when they got rid of a program for general assistance that helped the poorest of the poor who didn't qualify for all these other programs get $200 cash assistance every month and the Republicans, they got rid of that. Well, disproportionately, those folks who received those monies were black people. And we can see how black people are over-policed, how we are um, criminalized, all of our behaviors and such. And it is an extension from slavery. And even those states that uh, outlawed slavery long before the Civil War, long before Emancipation Proclamation and 13th Amendment were benefiting from uh, enslaved laborers. Um, whether it's the institutions like uh, Columbia University uh, was basically built to support the, the merchant, the sons of the merchants class, literally. And one of the ancestors of mine who helped create Columbia University, King's College, um, was a, a serial rapist and was a fifth generation enslaver. And the, father, the patriarch of that line was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And when I talk about... Um, reparations. It connects all of us within and beyond families, communities, and states. And it's a discussion that we must have because if we really want to move forward, we have to understand what we're trying to leave behind and what those legacies are and how they impugn our espoused values as Americans. So let's talk about the actual bill. Um, what are you presenting in this bill? And uh, just as important, how are your colleagues? <laughs> <laughs> responding to the bill. How likely is it to get passed? Let's just put it that way. My, my <laughs> Who do colleague, we have to call? Who do we have to call to help out? Uh, you have to call a lot of voters to make sure that enough public servants who understand history and our you know, complicity in all of this are elected so that there will be 102 votes to pass this. But um, the, I have decided to, put, uh, to uh, push the brakes and change course. So I have not formally introduced the bill because I want more stakeholder feedback. I want more feedback from not just academics and activists, but regular folk get their input to make sure that this is the strongest bill possible. Because even if it doesn't come up for a vote in Pennsylvania, if the template is compelling, then my colleagues in other state legislatures, where there are majorities of progressive minded people, can take this template and use it for their purposes, particularly states that are not in the South, because how we process slavery in the North and the Northeast and the West et cetera, is very different than what happened. So our reconstruction was very different, right? 
we didn't have that same kind of intermediary period. It was felt it was a different lived experience in different state laws. So I want to use this as a template um, for other state legislatures, and I want to create this platform to communicate about why reparations is so important and why white people benefit from reparations. You know, we always have to <laughs> center these conversations one. on how it benefits. Everything white has people, to right? be, it's, 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 this is insane. It's like everything needs to be filtered through the Marianne Williamson needs to present reparations to greater America. And Don Lemon still says, What makes you? <laughs> it's like, well, because the white people are going to listen to me. That's why. <laughs> Right. I mean, this is the conversation we have to have. And I'm prepared to go well outside of my comfort zone. I've, I've gone to an ex, uh, a, a virtually all white uh, elderly um, uh, group and talked about reparations and I was able to get through to them. I'll go to rural Pennsylvania. I'll go to farmers, bankers and make my case. Um, and I believe that when you make these conversations, make these inroads in good faith, and you, you don't impugn people's uh, motives, and you just lay the information out there, particularly as it relates to state laws, because my bill will address not just slavery, but systemic racism. And for all of my colleagues who don't believe in the existence of, of systemic racism, then the response to them is, how do you describe this bill, um, this law, this law, this law, this law, that specifically and explicitly negates black lives like for centuries because most of my colleagues black white urban rural democrat republican don't memorize all state laws that have have been enacted in pennsylvania you know since 1776 they haven't done it so it's my responsibility to say hey look here's the context here's the compendium of white supremacist laws that have explicitly impacted negatively black folk what is your response to that? And can you not see the connection between all of these things over generations to the disparities that exist now? I'd be very curious to see their responses. How much money are we talking about? Marianne Williamson uh, started at 500 million. Now she's, she's pushing a trillion, but how much money um, in Pennsylvania? And it would come from Pennsylvania, I assume. It's, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. So that's a very easy uh, question to answer. You ready? The answer is until there are no racial disparities. So, so how does for, that play out? Let's let's. Well, I mean, yeah, but I, I guess the the I guess the point I'm trying to make is, um, it there it, there will no there will not be a definitive lump sum because first of all it's virtually impossible to know what that figure is, and two is the only thing that matters is that that money is ultimately put in service of leveling the playing field and having racial equity, which we've never had before. So we don't actually know what that will take in full. What we have to do is empower stakeholders to see what are all the intervention points to address the disparities around healthcare, education, housing, entrepreneurship, employment, all of these things, and then figure out, okay, what are the revenue sources that we can use to put towards these efforts because we're talking about a green economy, right? We're talking about the Green New Deal. Well, the problem with the New Deal was it was very racist. It was very sexist, right? Um, I don't want a, a New Deal 2.0 if it doesn't learn from the lessons uh, of the Roosevelt administration, right? I want to make sure that we place, we create programs that actually address these systemic issues. So I don't know what that number is, but I do know that the process of figuring it out has to be meaningful and inclusive and can't go to some blue ribbon task force of, of academics who are totally disconnected from reality without community buy-in. And ultimately, whatever that fund is or funds has to be independent and autonomous, right? If you don't trust black folk to address issues of most concern to us, there's no way this is gonna work. So I hate to use this word because it's just um, the, 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 the form has been used for horrible things like charter schools, but would it be like a voucher? Would you provide vouchers for, for healthcare until we pass Medicare for all? Would you provide vouchers for a down payment on a house uh, or, or, or whatever you're envisioning um, in terms right. of the systemic issues we're still facing? So no, it's a, it's, it's a fair question and, and, you know, language is, is always important. Um, so there are, individual benefits that should be provided. But if we're talking about addressing systemic issues, then we have to have systemic solutions. And 
frankly, there are folks who believe in blackface capitalism. I don't. So you say, well, oh, well, this is how white folk have gotten over. This is what we need. Give us our money so that we can uh, exploit other people too and start our own corporations and just really mirror the problem that has, you know, that that is the cause of all of this, right? When you talk about proto-capitalism, that was the transatlantic slave trade, right? Um, so we have to have systemic solutions, which means that we have to have reparations that have a collective benefit. It's not just about me, Chris Rabb, getting a check for my family, for my kids and whatever. But I think there are circumstances where individuals merit that. So for instance, um, um, when you talk about social security, black men have a very short lifespan compared to pretty much everyone else in this country, perhaps other than indigenous folk. So we don't get the be full benefit of social security like most of our, our counterparts. So maybe if you're a certain age, you get something. Um, maybe if you are a descendant of an enslaved Pennsylvanian, you get something. Or your people have been here for five generations, you get special consideration. I've only been in Pennsylvania 18 years. If there are people who've been here 180 years, I think they deserve more because the premise of my legislation is that um, the longer you've been black in Pennsylvania, the more you have suffered, right? And I've suffered 18 years, but if, you know, so I think that it should be a sliding scale. Um, but most importantly, it should be these programs that benefit communities that have been longstanding black communities so that the uplift is not just individuated, it's collective. Fascinating. Um, all right. So I know, I know you've put the brakes on it because you want some more support, uh, feedback from, from different stakeholders, but how can folks help out for, I mean, just, is there any way to help you with the bill? Are there stakeholders who could be watching that could help you out? Well, absolutely. I will be, um, I will be recirculating um, the proposal mm -hmm. to introduce uh, um, this bill probably um, in the next few weeks. Um, people can co-sponsor it before the actual bill has been released. So having folks uh, go to reprab.com or follow me on Twitter or Instagram at reprab, R-A-B-B, -B, like rabble rouser, um, you can find out, you know, um, how to support and get folks on board while we do essentially like a road tour so that we can have the discussion. If the best thing we can do is... Um, increase our level of knowledge about why this matters and how it can play out. And then we work through the details, but we have to get on the same page first. And that takes a while. And it's a great process because you can, you can build bridges with folks who you otherwise would think, oh, there's no way. I have white folk who were not politicized, mm -hmm. who when they heard me speak, were shocked at how reasonable I was yeah. and how awful state laws have been. They had no idea because we don't learn about this stuff through corporate media. We don't learn about it through um, school. We, so few people know this. And so just sharing the information in good faith and saying how we are all complicit and we're all responsible and we can all benefit from this creates a great opportunity to bring people together outside of our usual echo chambers. And that's really, that's really powerful. And then once you have those people who, uh, those, those other lawmakers who've signed on, we'll be ready to make phone calls and write letters and do all yeah. that we can. Wow. Uh, Rep. Rab, I can't wait for you to be president. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you liked me, Nomi. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I want to be able to call somebody up and <laughs> be able to get through. That's <laughs> Draft rep rap. <laughs> and then I love to be like pres rap. It doesn't have the same alliteration. Yeah, it doesn't have the same thing. I might just have to stay rep. I can live with that. All right. Always a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for, for your, just your, your, so your, your, your courage, uh, your historic perspective. I mean, you've, you're always coming equipped with, um, with the facts of the history. Always a pleasure. All right, special thanks. Who do we have in here? Uh, wow, okay. Torches and pitchforks, that's how I feel right now. Uh, $5, thank you so much, says, you can't afford Patreon, it's okay. If, if, by the way, guys, if you can't afford a Patreon or if you're, um, you know, if you, if you want to take a couple of months off, or whatever, 
please send me a note at the Nomi Key Show at gmail.com. We are happy to work out whatever needs to be worked out. Um, you know, this is a collective. The more folks know about the show, the show grows. That's why it's so important to click share and subscribe and like and all those things because the algorithm builds it up. But if you're not able to do so, we still want you to listen. Uh, and of course, on Patreon, you get every single show through an audio version and then we put in extra content. And, you know, obviously the higher you go up on the on the ladder, there's like swag and other things. But, um, you know, definitely send us a note, the Nomi Key Show at gmail.com. Uh, Dustin Price, thank you for the love. Prairie Fire Kowalski from Nebraska says, we have a massive surplus of food in the United States and people are going hungry. We are a failed state by definition since a basic necessity is at risk 100%. Thanks to everybody in the chat, all the Nomi kids, as Harvey K, Professor Harvey K says, and special, special thanks to Midi Doctors for working those algorithms and our moderator, Bob, for keeping our chat room troll free. We will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow is Fem Friday. We have an amazing show. We're going to talk about the uh, woke feminism that is taking over the White House. It's an important show. So make sure to check it out tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. Be well, stay safe, and we'll see you tomorrow.